Uh, my name is Clayton Duby, and it's my privilege to be from the USC US China Institute. And it's a big week here at USC. On Friday, we are going to be inaugurating uh, C.L. Max Nikias as the 11th president of the university. While he was provost, Max Nikias established the USC US China Institute expressly to focus on the U.S.-China relationship in all its dimensions, how it was changing, why it mattered, and to look at critical trends in contemporary China. This focus on China remains a strategic priority here at USC. Unfortunately, uh, President Nikias has another commitment and can't be with us today, but he asked that I extend to you his warmest of welcomes. <coughs> And it's, of course, my pleasure to do just that. Thank you all for coming uh, to today's symposium. We're going to be looking back at what went into making the week that changed the world. That week in February 1972, when President Nixon traveled to China. We are extremely fortunate to have a distinguished panel to speak on that subject. After that, we're going to look at U.S.-China relations in the context of China's rising global influence. 38 years ago, Richard Nixon stepped off a plane in Beijing. He extended his hand to Premier Zhou Enlai. And this ushered in a new age in U.S.-China relations. It signaled the beginning of big, big changes. Reconfiguring the U.S.-China relationship had been on Richard Nixon's mind for quite some time. He wrote about it in 1967, a year before he was elected President of the United States. In an article in Foreign Affairs, he said, we simply cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations, there to nurture its fantasies, cherish its hates, and threaten its neighbors. He was determined to change that. Now, the behind-the-scenes diplomacy began in late 1970, with both the Chinese and Americans working through Pakistani representatives. Both sides subsequently seized on the opportunity, the opening, that presented itself with the ping pong tournament in Tokyo that led to a chance encounter between the Chinese team and one member of the American team. It was our privilege to earlier host here at USC Zhuang Zedong, uh, the member of the Chinese team who extended uh, his friendship to Glenn Cowan, the Southern Californian uh, table tennis player, uh, on that bus. You know, of course, that the American team traveled to China in April 1971. At that time, President Nixon spoke quite clearly that he hoped, in some capacity, to get to China. Not long after that, President Nixon dispatched his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, to China, setting in motion the events that we are going to be talking about today. After that July meeting between Secretary Kissinger and Prime Minister Zhou Enlai, it was agreed that President Nixon would go to China. But how? How would he go? How is this possible? That journey, that journey didn't just happen. Uh, as you know, we did not have diplomatic relations. That's why the opening was so important. And so that meant there was, uh, we didn't have the usual infrastructure upon which to draw to prepare for such a visit. The task of making this trip possible and making it successful fell to his staff. Most importantly, the three gentlemen that we're honored to have with us today as part of this first panel. They're going to be telling you about the bureaucratic and cultural divides that had to be bridged, the work that was necessary to orchestrate this important summit. Where would they go? With whom would they speak? On what subjects? Who would travel with them? How would news be disseminated? All of these things had to be worked out in meticulous detail. And even after working all of this out in great detail, the staff had to be prepared to make last-minute adjustments. 
because things, as they often do in China, change. You're going to be hearing about all of that. Once again, today's symposium is divided into two parts. The first part features uh, those who helped to make, helped to bring about the week that changed the world. And then the second part features six scholars who are going to be speaking on U.S.-China relations, on China's place in its region, as well as China's place in its world. A lot of people have worked hard to make this event possible. I'd like to highlight the contribution made by Vina Sansarati of the U.S.-China Institute, and also the contribution made by Anthony Curtis of the Nixon Foundation. Without these two individuals, we wouldn't be here at this moment. This event, though, would not be possible were it not for the vision, the energy, the imagination of Mr. Sandy Quinn, president of the Nixon Foundation. It's a great pleasure to welcome Sandy back to USC. He's a Trojan, back to USC, and for him to invite him to introduce our distinguished panel. Sandy? Thank you, Clay. I'm with the Richard Nixon Foundation, which is located on the magnificent 13-acre campus of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda. How many of you have ever gone down to uh, Yorba Linda and visited the Nixon Library? I'm only here one second. Uh, okay. Only staff members. Well, that's good. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, my staff. But uh, <laughs> I know it's, uh, it's an hour away. It's an experience you should all put on your calendar while you're here at, uh, at SC. Uh, the foundation's role is to enrich, uh, to communicate, to spread uh, the word about Richard Nixon's magnificent, extraordinary contributions as the 37th President of the United States. It's a lot more than resignation. It's a lot more, really, than the opening of China. It has immense uh, imaginative initiatives in the broad uh, spectrum of domestic affairs and foreign affairs beyond uh, just China, including Russia and, and elsewhere. But we have embarked this year and next on a very aggressive series of Nixon legacy forums, and this symposium is one of those, where we want to bring the eyewitnesses, um, indeed the participants, the creators, the architects, uh, the people who were with the president uh, at uh, uh, the incredible moments of his administration when great policies and great uh, steps were taken. None more significant, of course, than that of the opening of China. Uh, we have two panels today. One is from our friends at the Nixon Center, which is a Washington, D.C. Uh, based think tank, and we have three of their uh, respected, distinguished uh, scholars, uh, two of whom, and perhaps all three, have served in, in the White House or in, in, on State Department staffs uh, of, of presidents. And then the first panel, the one you're going to hear now, is made up of those who went to China on that very first historic trip with President Nixon. And these are people who were at his side, who helped make the arrangements in advance, and the people who were in Beijing, Peking, making those arrangements were there indeed before the president was. They communicated to the White House on a daily basis about what was going on and what steps should be taken, getting direction from Bob Haldeman and the president himself. And they're represented here today as well. So I'd like to introduce them, the first of whom is uh, Colonel Jack Brennan. Jack, if you would take your seat. Uh, yeah. Vietnam uh, veteran. He was, uh, I can't say was, because Marines it is. So he is a Marine. He was the military aide to the President and was with him not only just during that trip, but on some of the most important car rides and, and meetings where it was just the President and the Colonel. And he'll tell you about that in a minute. Second is Larry Higby. Larry is a member of the board of the Nixon Foundation. He had a distinguished business career following his work at the White House where he was assistant 
uh, to Bob Haldeman, indeed Assistant White House Chief of Staff, <coughs> who accompanied the President and was as involved as anyone in the making of that trip and the end result of its success and the, and the Shanghai communique. Thank you for coming, Larry. Mm -hmm. um, our moderator is Dwight Chapin. Oh, I've got to say one thing, though, about Larry. And a little bit apologetically, he is a Bruin. You should know that. <laughs> However, he's a Bruin. He, he's a Bruin by education, but by tuition, he's SC. We have him because he has two kids here. So <laughs> he's written his checks here. That, that is what counts. No, but uh, thank you. Uh, now, another Trojan, Dwight Chapin, is our moderator. Dwight uh, started with President Nixon in 1962. <coughs> he uh, ran for uh, governor of California. He was a field representative. He's from the San Fernando Valley, as I am. Uh, he uh, was uh, involved uh, uh, as a personal aide, assistant to President Nixon throughout uh, the campaigns, and went to the White House with him, was office right outside his door, uh, working as a, a senior White House aide. He uh, was on the other end of the phone when Ron Walker and the people who were in uh, Peking making the arrangements called in for direction. So uh, it's an honor to have him. It's an honor to have all three of them, all old and close friends of mine. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Well, th we're here to talk about how President Nixon changed the modern world. You're going to have your panel a little later that gets into the substantive side of uh, this historic trip and what it opened up and the consequences that are being dealt with today. But we're really here to kind of give you a, a little bit of an insight into the inside story as to how all of this got started. And as Sandy clearly said, Jack Brennan, who was very, very close to President Nixon and who served as the military aide on the trip. Larry, again to remind you, was he at this point was the assistant to Bob Haldeman. Haldeman was chief of staff to President Nixon. And as Haldeman was to Nixon, Larry was to Haldeman. And then my role was that I was the uh, kind of the acting chief of protocol. I was in charge of the log logistics side of, of this trip. And it was a very historic time in our lives. Larry is going to lead off here <clears throat> and give you a little background as to the state of the world and the thinking when we first learned that we were going to be going to China. Larry? Thank you, Dwight. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, we had this thing called the Vietnam War. And back during that time of the Nixon administration, it dominated any policy discussion, foreign or domestic, that took place in the United States or among world powers. So you had a situation in which we were trying to solve a war, trying to create a peace, and simultaneously trying to do with a Cold War nation in Russia and a nation that basically we didn't know in China. 750 million people that were largely, at that point in time, cut off from the world. In addition to that, you had to remember that Russia and China were not particularly good friends. Indeed, there have been border squabbles back and forth for them for a long time. Finally, Nixon was worried that if, in fact, we were to bomb North Vietnam, both China and Russia, most certainly Russia, would very likely come down and enter the war in a more formal way. So we had a number of tensions <coughs> going on in the world at that time and a nation that was largely cut off from any kind of modern communication or information that the rest of the world was joining. When he looked at the opportunity, he saw the opportunity to counterbalance Russia and some of its influence by becoming closer to China. But it had to be very delicately handled because <coughs> China also had relations with Vietnam at that point in time, and you couldn't undo that. So we begin down this very delicate path of trying to not only end the Vietnam War, calm down Russia, but also bring China into the modern world. Uh, the thing that I remember, and the first time I even knew that we were doing anything like this, and I saw the CIA, CIA briefing papers every morning, so this was something that was known by only about five or six people, was Henry wandered into my uh, office at the Henry White who? House. What? Henry who? Henry Kissinger, I'm sorry, I wandered into my, he was the <coughs> security advisor to the president uh, on, I think, a Thursday or Friday afternoon, going off on the next round of peace negotiations, peace talks that 
we were supposed to have in Vietnam. And we talked for a while because Haldeman was on the phone and then he, he uh, sort of said, I may be doing a little additional traveling. That's all he said, went in and saw Bob. And after he was done, he came out of the chief of staff's office and I was called in by Haldeman. And that's when he told me for the first time, Henry's not just going to Vietnam, uh, he's going to China. Clay was absolutely right when he implied that to call this uh, ping pong diplomacy is a misnomer. It was at least a five year structured uh, reasons to get to the point where finally there was an, an implied invitation for a high level representative to come to China to make arrangements for a trip of the president. <clears throat> this culminated, this build up culminated with the world's most famous upset stomach. When, uh, <laughs> when Dr. Kissinger was in Pakistan in a meeting with President Yahya Khan, who had been one of the two contacts with the People's Republic of China, uh, he conveniently got uh, first exhausted, uh, is what the reported to the press, he was exhausted and had to go to like their Camp David to rest, resting for a day. They had such a, a plan going on, they had planned a dinner and then uh, the dinner was only planned so that they could cancel it and then they had a big motorcade going up. And, in fact, Henry was just hundreds of yards away from the presidential palace in a little cottage. Whisked away at three o'clock in the morning to a Pakistani plane, airplane, flown into China. No one knew. There's no communication for two days. This is, and the press thought, well, he has a, he's sick. And uh, on July 11th, he came out of, after two days of, of discussions with primarily Zhou Enlai, Premier Zhou Enlai, he came back into Pakistan and the Eureka means he, he sent a cable. We had no communications. He sent a cable to his assistant, which was General Haig. We're all down here in San Clemente at the time. General Haig said, I got a message from, a cable from Dr. Kissinger and the president said, what did it say? It said, Eureka, which meant everything's set. You're welcome, come. The, I, I should say aside, this is an anxious time. Why anxious? Because in effect, we could have, it, what could have been an incredible embarrassment. Mao Zedong could have said, the American president chooses to come here, but those running dogs are not allowed. Uh, you know, it could have been just an embarrassment, a terrible embarrassment. Well, there was, also, you, you there was also a worry that, you know, suppose they decided to hold Henry Kissinger hostage. And they, they, there were a lot of suggestions. <laughs> that would have helped in some they, they, have, <laughs> they, they should send more secret service with him. And finally, somebody, you know, who's smart enough said, look, if the Chinese want to do anything while Henry's there, they're going to do it. We don't have enough secret service to worry about it. So he went in with a very small party and just a couple of aides. He returned, and if you'll recall, he returned to San Clemente. The president had, over the weekend, flown out to San Clemente, uh, to the Western White House, and Henry Kissinger returned there, immediately went in uh, to see the president. Frankly, nobody, hardly anybody on the White House staff knew anything except that Henry was getting back from Vietnam. Um, there was some negotiation and some uh, consultation, and then the president, without saying why, said that he requested time on NBC to address the nation on a very important matter. What that meant. White House correspondent Tom Jarrell in Los Angeles, California. Good evening. President Nixon tonight has flown from his home at San Clemente to a television studio here in Los Angeles to deliver what the White House terms a major statement. The president this week has been conferring extensively with Secretary of State William Rogers and Mr. Nixon's National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, leading to speculation that tonight's subject will be in the area of foreign policy. Here now is the President of the United States with what the White House terms a major statement. Good evening. I have requested this television time tonight to announce a major development in our efforts to build a lasting peace in the world. As I have pointed out on a number of occasions over the past three years, there can be no stable and enduring peace without the participation of the People's Republic of China and its 750 million people. That is why I have undertaken initiatives in several areas to open the door for more normal relations between our two countries. In pursuance of that goal, I sent Dr. Kissinger, my assistant for national security affairs, to Peking during his recent world tour for the purpose of having talks with Premier Zhou Enlai. The announcement I shall now read is being issued simultaneously in Peking and in the United States. Premier Zhou Enlai and Dr. Henry Kissinger, President Nixon's Assistant for National Security Affairs, held talks in Peking from July 9 to 11, 1971. 
knowing of President Nixon's expressed desire to visit the People's Republic of China, Premier Zhou Enlai, on behalf of the government of the People's Republic of China, has extended an invitation to President Nixon to visit China at an appropriate date before May 1972. At least the world was surprised and the press were flabbergasted, so much so that one of the all-knowing uh, <clears throat> hosts stared into the cameras like a frightened deer and had nothing to say. Just complete, complete shock. This is the next day's edition of the New York Times, and although it tells about, look at the part that Dwight has circled, the action is not expensive. Old friends, that referred, of course, to Taiwan. All of the negotiations through our secret channels, for almost always, the Chinese response was, we may uh, have communications to speak about Taiwan, nothing else. And then finally, when they agreed to speak with something, else, some, something other than Taiwan, Taiwan being primary, then things progressed. So what's interesting is that no one knew that this was going to happen. Larry being an exception, two or three other people. The announcement was made in Burbank, California, and then the question became, how in the world are we going to do this? What is involved? We did not know anything about going to China. Uh, we had to try to figure this out. So there were players at the White House, the president in charge of everything. It's a very important point. The president was the architect of this trip. Kissinger, he was part of the construction group. He was the builder. But there were several people involved, intricately involved in the trip. Henry and Haig and the, NBC, uh, the NSC contributors worked on the substance. Bob Haldeman was in charge of all the arrangements, and that's who I reported, reported to. And then we ended up with two men uh, in uh, the PRC, Ron Walker, and then our dear friend Til Tim Elborn, who is deceased, but was a Trojan. He was a fraternity brother of mine and Sandy's here at USC. Uh, Dr. Kissinger went over, as we pointed out, in July of 1971. Then we <clears throat> put together a, a trip that I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a few minutes that went back in October of 71. There were uh, around nine of us on that trip. And then we went back again for the, uh, the second time for me, third time for uh, several of the people in January of 1972 with General Haig. There was a lot going on on these trips, as you'll probably hear in the next panel, in terms of trying to get a communique put together. And it was not successfully put together uh, until the last, till, till, till the end of the actual presidential trip. Yeah, almost all, all trips are really prearranged by a president and you're going through formalities. We still had no agreement on the communique after the second, uh, after Haig's visit in January of 1972. So clearly this was an even more dicey activity that had a lot of substance still to be resolved. You there probably was, heard the lawyer. You probably have heard the lawyer story. Don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. Well, uh, in this case, it's you know, don't go out and, and, and visit a country unless you know where you're going to end up before you complete that trip. Did you want to say something? Just to, my memory in Shanghai was the last moments. Uh, Dr. Kissinger had a, a makeshift office, and everyone was scurrying around with last-minute wording of the Shanghai communique. This is literally minutes before it was going to be issued. So when this trip started out, now keep in mind, nobody knew that this was going to happen. So the president originally, originally he said there'll be no press that go on this trip. Yeah, he loved the press. <laughs> there'll be no press on this trip. Then he came to the position that he would take a military jet star that he had never yeah, been he on, never flown which holds 13 people. Yeah, he had no idea how small they were. But that was what he was going to do. Uh, and then events started happening. What started happening was that in the media, every, this whole thing started just building. And it's a very important part of understanding this whole thing. It just got bigger and bigger. And, and the media contributed to this. I mean, the uh, historians, you name it. Everybody started getting into the act. Week after week on the cover of Time, Newsweek, and so forth. We didn't have the 24-7 channels or they would have been into orgasms. Uh, in any case, uh, we ended up with 354 roughly going on this trip, which was the official party, the press, the military, Secret Service, staff, and others. So we had to take Air Force One, a couple of other planes, and uh, the logistics were 
quite complex, uh, particularly because we did not know the infrastructure which Clay referred to in China. We, we were really quite ignorant on that side. Well, just a simple question like, how do you land at an airport in China? So, being Americans, uh, being Americans, we, uh, I, sh I should point out we were, had set up a room down in the bomb shelter of the White House. And uh, I, I had been President Nixon's appointment secretary. I was relieved of those duties and assigned full time getting this trip put together. So we sat down uh, and had the Boeing people come from Seattle. And we put together a huge binder. And this binder solved all issues because we're Americans, we can solve anything. And uh, we came up with the idea that in order to service the radio, television, and so forth community, we would get a 747 decked out with satellite dishes and everything, and we did diagrams showing how the 747 was divided into various studios for audio, uh, for video production, and so forth. And all we would have to do is get this thing built in Seattle, fly it over and land, and we would solve all of the communications issues. Well, we went over in October on Henry's trip, Henry Kissinger's trip, and we presented this document. And of course, everybody nodded and, oh, this, you know, th and we didn't get any comments back about yes, no, or maybe, or whatever. Uh, and, and they read the plan. The interesting thing is, we got no answers. We left. We kept asking them what was going on with this particular concept. And uh, it was when we went back with General Haig in January, and we had landed, and they wanted to show us something. And they took us over to a part of the airport where they had constructed a building that was just basically in the dimensions with the same size studios and so forth that we had had in the book for the 747. They had put it all there and built the, built the building out of brick. And the idea, of course, being that in order to save face for their country and so forth, there was no way they were going to take our idea and use it as we had presented it. But we did end up with the facility at the airport and it was the way that the press were serviced when they were in country. Jack? Some of you are from China. Many of you have visited China. All of you saw China's being presented in the Olympics as a marvelous city that you see here. However, when we saw it, this is the 1972 version of a snowplow. This is hundreds of China, the first, very first morning I walked out from, all of us did, walked out to see, wow, what an incredible place we're at. And it had snowed the night before. And the streets, the main streets in Peking then, <coughs> covered with snow. And suddenly you see hundreds, maybe ten, more, ten of people. Thousand, ten thousand. Well, yeah. the whole street in front of us. Hundreds were just makeshift brooms. That was a snowplow cleaning the streets. And that's where they started in 1972. So we got ourselves organized at the White House. As I mentioned, we had the kind of the headquarters down in the bomb shelter. Uh, By the way, unless you understand the bomb shelter, this bomb shelter was really built at President Roosevelt's time. Yeah, it would not stop any World bomb. It wouldn't stop any bomb. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's where it's, I it's just, where I slept yeah. if I had to work late at the White House. It's just yeah. the only <laughs> extra room there is in the White it House. It always impressed everybody to say we were in the bomb shelter, but it would. Uh, <laughs> there had, is no giant secret room down there like you see in the movies. <laughs> well, it's maybe the basement, maybe right. things have changed. Well, things have changed. Yeah. Uh, never mind, never mind. We had NSC representatives, the military aides, Secret Service, CIA would come in for briefings. Some State Department people started coming over, and that's a part that you can get into with the next panel. State Department was really not into uh, a lot of the planning on this trip, although as, as we got closer, we started getting documents and so forth from them. The President, again, leading everything, Dr. Kissinger and Bob Haldeman. I've got to emphasize our, our good friend Bob Haldeman because he really took, uh, held the reins on this very closely and, and was incredibly demanding of all of us on the trip. Uh, Tim Elborn and Ron Walker, Ron Walker being a very special friend of ours who, by the way, is the chairman and, uh, of, of the Richard Nixon Foundation uh, in Yorba Linda. Uh, but they, Ron and Tim were in country and I would talk to them every day, twice a day, morning and night, we would converse. For the first uh, two or three weeks that they were in country, 
they would have to drive out to the airport and there was this new thing called a satellite suitcase. And we would use this satellite suitcase to communicate back and forth. And uh, one of the key elements of the trip is that if, if you're making a presidential trip in the United States, all of the details are worked out. Everything is known. In this particular situation, we would ask the Chinese, you know, what we were going to be doing, let's say, on day three or day two. And we would get these blank stares. In fact, the joke used to be something like they would bring the group another tangerine. Have or another something. tangerine. You have Is another tangerine, but they would never get an answer as to, you know, what, what was happening. So that was a very frustrating part of trying to put this trip together was trying to get the Chinese to commit. Of course, they're trying to understand the needs. They've never gone through anything like this before. Another thing that's kind of interesting is that we would be given, uh, or I, I should say I was given because it would usually come to me, I was the one making the contacts uh, back and forth to Ron and Tim for the most part. I mean, others came on, onto the conference calls, but we would be told of certain things to mention that were kind of pieces of information that Dr. Kissinger was trying to, or the president, trying to get the Chinese leaders to focus on. And the importance of that is that everything we were doing was being obviously noted and listened to by the PRC. And so if we made some comment about it would be great if Premier Cho would do X, Y, or Z, uh, they, while we, I was really talking to Ron, uh, it was a message that was being noted by the Chinese. So we use that vehicle a lot in order to try to get certain points across. Uh, the Chinese had limousines that were manufactured by the Russians and airplanes manufactured by the Russians because they did not have the infrastructure to do it. Uh, and we used their car and we used their airplane. We used their airplane to fly from Beijing to Hangzhou. Which was unheard of. We always, always <coughs> had to fly an Air Force One. We always had to use it, and to this day, bring our own car. An awful lot of that is a requirement that the president stay in communications with the Congress. So even on this plane, we had to bring our own communications package to put it on it. But no one, especially CIA, who knew how their pilots were, the brief said, don't ever let the president on a, on a Soviet plane. And it's a yeah. Soviet built plane. The, 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 se the, secret <coughs> service, the Secret Service was beside themselves beside themselves. And then what happened, just to jump to another thing, in May, President Nixon went to Moscow. And when we got to Russia to plan that trip, there was no way they were going to have us bring in our own limousines and airplanes. We had to use the Russian cars and the Russian planes there because there was no way that we were going to do that in China and not do it in Russia. So it had, this Huge had fight. consequences. Larry? Yeah, I think, I think it was interesting. Uh, we, we took a little side thing here to, to try and make you understand that this trip was more than just an opening of something. Everything we did had symbolism, and everything we did was part of trying to being able to communicate the message uh, to China, to, not, from China to the world about what we were trying to get done. And it took several forms. First of all, we game plan television and print coverage across the boards. There were, there were usually two, two news cycles back then. There was an AM cycle, the morning shows, and an evening cycle, which lasted half an hour, sometimes an hour, which were the evening news shows. And those were the only two times you could really communicate with the American public when they were on a news, on a news basis. So we planned every headline out to the best we could, what the picture would say, how it would reinforce the headline, what we hoped the caption would be if we were really controlling the message and what the quote was we wanted to have that came out of that particular event. Uh, do we, I think, let's go to the next one here. Right. These are some examples of this. First of all, the trip to the Great Wall was in the morning in China, but it was in the evening in the United States and actually was broadcast live right from the Great Wall. So America got to experience exactly what was going on over there. The Shanghai communi communique was the same thing. We did it in the morning because we wanted it to be the evening news. We wanted to get the largest possible audience that we could for that event. We used Mrs. Nixon in another way. She'd go out often in the late afternoon because that would hit the morning shows. 
in the United States and present a different image, often an every, a much more image about what the Chinese people were like, what the customs was like, what the culture was like, what it was like to go to a school in China back then. So we were trying to make sure we presented the broadest possible picture of China that, that, and, and the American people got to come along and help, uh, help and actually discover what we were discovering on a daily basis. And the Chinese government was so impressed with the fact that we could transmit instantaneously these images throughout the world that at the end of the trip they said, don't take that equipment down, we just want to buy it. And they bought it all. The, the other thing though I think you have to realize beyond that is the fact that this was equally as, <laughs> equally as important for China. And why was that? Because for most of the world this was the first insight that the world had to what China was like and what was going on there. So they wanted their coverage to be good also. They wanted to show uh, a people in the West different parts of the United, different parts of the world and what was going on there in their country. So it was very important to them too. I would like to mention, to add to what Larry has said, it was not insignificant that whenever you saw Mrs. Nixon, she was in a red coat. And it was part of the strategy, it was part of the contrast. It may seem very rinky-dink, but it spoke volumes. So we had the national media. We had the media players. As the world unfolded later on, there were the media who went to China and those who did not go. And it was so it was a, a, a real distinction among the media in the United States to be part of this. Huge investments by the media companies in, in terms of sending their uh, correspondents uh, or writers on the trip. The and camera people. Equipment. And the cam everything. The equipment. Yeah. Uh, no 24-7 news channels, as Larry has mentioned. You know, we had the three major ones. We had dedicated program. Larry mentions the news coverage on the Great Wall, uh, which was in the morning in China. At home here, it was like an hour and a half, two hour specials, every network, PBS, you name it. You could, not get, you could not get away from this trip. The morning shows, for example, had Mrs. Nixon, as Dwight described, looking at the tiny panda bears, which is going to be their gift, their official gift to the United States, which wound up in the Washington Zoo, as a matter of fact. Now, I'll try to, uh, uh, we're going to see a piece of video here in a minute. Here's Helen Thomas that you people have probably heard about. She just resigned from the White House, the AP, here, here's Dan Rather, Barbara Walters, Walter Cronkite. Over here is Eric Tom Severide, uh, Tom Gerald, who you saw earlier. This thing was laced with the movers and shakers of the media world. Including the executives who wanted to go just to say they'd been there. Yeah. <laughs> we, not reporters at all. All of a sudden. Presidents had, of the A lot of, the of people networks. went down to reporter level. So this is, we are now, this picture is from Hang Chow, this piece of uh, video footage from Hang Chow where the president had his picture taken with all the media. And there's Walter Cronkite right over there. Uh, here's Helen Thomas, Barbara Walters. And there, they got, here's Teddy White who wrote the famous book. Uh, this is Ollie Atkins, our White House photographer, getting everybody organized. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, who arrives but President Nixon? Ron Ziegler, the press secretary, and uh, so they, they, they had this picture taken. And then, uh, as the president was wont to do, once he got this picture done, you're going to see him turn around and he starts talking to the, uh, talking to the assembled media. And the thing, I, in, in putting this clip together the other day, I thought it was very interesting because Helen Thomas has lasted so many years. You'll see, if you look carefully, she's the only one writing. I mean, <laughs> which is, she'll start writing the minute the president starts talking here. We don't hear him because we don't have audio with this. The guy in glasses, is that Ron Ziegler was SC? Ron Ziegler was SC. Helen writing? Is Dan, Dan Rather? Rather. Probably. Dan Rather looking up to the So that's enough of that, but this gives you a flavor for it. Larry, this uh, is a key point. I think that, the, that what probably most people don't understand is the tremendous amount of work that the president spent and the preparation that he did. And he did it basically in three things. First of all, there was the State Department and all the things that they were contributing. 
Secondly, the CIA and the things that they were contributing in terms of briefing, an awful lot of that had to come from third parties because basically we didn't have anything going on in China at that point in time. China was really a sealed off area of the world. And third, from just individual people who had lived in China or who traveled in China that would come in and spend time with him, really trying to help him understand what was going on. He, uh, he spent hours, had these giant briefing books from everybody that we went through, trying to get up to speed on what China was. And why was that important? Because every gesture and everything that the president does in China in a country like that has deep meaning. And he thought about what it was like when he got out of that plane, what he wanted to stand for, whether or not he wanted to shake somebody's hand, whether or not he would, how he would react the first time he met Mao, all these kinds of things he had spent hours thinking through. And if you go back and look at his notes, you can see over and over again what that was like. Before I go to the next one, I just want to point out that I, I was looking at a piece of video the other day by a British broadcaster who had the notes that he had gotten from the archives. And he was ridiculing the fact that Nixon had written down all of these things that he was going to do in complete detail. And, and he, he mentioned that as a sign of weakness or Nixon being frightened by what he was going into. He missed the thing entirely. The, the, the name, of the, it was preparation, preparation, preparation. He would think it through. He would know what he was going to do. That was how, how he worked. And that was why he was so exceptional. We've got a couple of pictures now of what it was like on Air Force One. This is actually a, a picture of Dwight here on Air Force One. Over here you can see Ron Ziegler, the press secretary. John Scally, <coughs> who worked actually in the Kennedy administration, who was one of the key figures on this trip. Uh, this is a picture of Dwight, myself, and Bob Haldeman also on the same trip. The trip actually took several days. Uh, we first flew to Hawaii, overnighted in Hawaii. Uh, then we flew to Guam and uh, overnighted in Guam. Then we flew into Shanghai, picked up pilots and translators in Shanghai, and then flew to Beijing, or as it was known then, Peking. And so it was a multi-day trip. But every single detail <coughs> had to be gone over over and over and over again. You can see. We both have our red pencils out here. This is Haldeman changing the schedule again. And uh, uh, probably as he book. usually was, sort of sitting there like us, you know, <laughs> trying because that, we can't quite me. keep up. That was me, he was mad. Yeah, we can't quite keep up with him. It was interesting. When we, when we took off from Andrews Air Force Base, we actually had the broadcast tuned in that the networks were covering of the takeoff. And we all clapped when we took off. And then when we took off from China, we all clapped even louder because it had been a very long, very tough an exhausting trip. Dr. Kissinger is on the left there, and then next to him by the window is Winston Lord, who later became ambassador to China. And uh, I'll point out these briefing books. These are little books. There were big books and little books so that were produced by the State Department that we could carry that had all of our schedules and itinerary. This is in the cabin, the presidential cabin on Air Force One, and he is with, you can't see it very well, Secretary of State Rogers, who's on trip and assistant to the president, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger. I briefed him just before we got off the plane in, uh, in uh, Peking, Beijing, and a significant thing was the handshake, as you'll see in just a minute. In, in, uh, to go back to 1954, our then Secretary of State, <coughs> John Forster Dulles, excuse me, yeah, Dulles, Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., refused to shake hands with Joe and Lai. Joe and Lai considered an insult for all those years. President Nixon wanted to rectify this and said, the importance of the handshake, keep everyone else back and make sure that he knows that I really want to shake hands with him and to rectify anything that happened in the past. We're starting again. This is the official arrival in uh, Peking. As Larry said, we stopped first in Shanghai to, and had to get a navigator and two interpreters to fly in. This is the arrival ceremony and notice they're incredibly tall Chinese military, all exactly the same height. Uh, and of course, they had 750 million people to choose from, so they could probably do that. Get them these. And what else is very significant here? No civilian population. Almost anywhere we went in the world, especially those seeking out foreign aid, there were thousands and thousands of people cheering. And so when I saw this, I said, uh, maybe they don't like us. What is this about? No one at the airport to greet us. It was a sunny day when we could arrive, but as we, we started into Beijing, and it's about an hour trip in it kept getting more and more gray and we were sort of getting as this ominous of the trip and we kept waiting for crowds and there were no crowds and on all of our cars they had curtains on the side so we couldn't see out well after a while I started getting curious and pulled the curtain back and looked a little bit and people were staring 
They all had to stay five or six blocks back from the main room, from the main route. But they were staring out and peering out behind their houses to see what was going on. Because you would have thought nobody lived in Peking if you looked at the road we were going into. But in fact, there were people staring everywhere, wondering what was going on. Remember, no Wondering why they weren't allowed to ride their yeah. bicycles yeah. that day. No communication, no newspapers <clears throat> available to them. So they had no knowledge of what was happening. So we arrived at the guest cottage, uh, the official guest cottage where the President Nixon was going to be staying. And in typical uh, Chinese style, they had a kind of a welcoming uh, period of tea. Here's Cho and Lai, the President, Mrs. Nixon. This is Brent Scowcroft, Bob Haldeman, Henry Kissinger. Uh, we were all sitting kind of in a, uh, in a semicircle. Uh, here I am, but this is a very important Notice man. there are a lot of pictures of Dwight. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 this gentleman here is, was Ambassador Han Su, who became the ambassador to the United States. He happened to be my counterpart and a terrific person. Uh, here's Rosemary Woods, President, President Sec Secretary. Terry. This is the meeting uh, that President Nixon had with Chairman Mao. What way, happened? This was the first same day. day. Same, same day. day. So we had the arrival. We went to the guest cottage. We had our tea, and then everybody was given time off. The president went to his quarters and uh, to relax. And a few minutes later, uh, uh, Ambassador Han Su, who came to me, he said, uh, "Premier Cho's here." I went. Uh, Premier Cho says, uh, "I need to find the president. Uh, we're going to go see the chairman." And so this was completely unexpected. It was not on an itinerary, nothing. We had to be flexible. We went, uh, Haldeman went in, got President Nixon. Uh, he said, get Dr. Kissinger. He did not say, get Secretary of State Rogers. Uh, and it was Nixon, Kissinger, and Winston Lord with the president who went uh, to this meeting. And so uh, th this is rather, this is the first time that the president met Cho, uh, Chairman Mao. Right, and it's sort of interesting. You notice that Nixon and Kissinger are right together, but there's a person in between uh, Joe and the chairman. This young lady was a translator. Uh, the chairman at that time it was very tough for even the best translators to often understand what he was saying uh, because of the condition of his health. And it turned out Kissinger was so surprised he went like this because she had actually taken courses from Kissinger at Harvard. And I think she's Jiang Ching's, she's uh, Mao's chairman, Mao's niece, was she not? Well, most so this, is, this is the guest palace. This, that, uh, this entrance right here is where Cho and Lai came to get Nixon to go see Mao. So this is the guest cottage that we were in. Now we're still on the first day. Uh, we're going to go from here. We're, we got in a, a motorcade late afternoon and went over for the m first meeting with uh, Premier Cho and Lai. And this is the first plenary session, some footage there, the President, Dr. Kissinger, John Holdridge, uh, and uh, Cho and Lai. John Holdridge is a China expert from the State Department. <clears throat> There's Premier Cho. And then from here, we went to the first welcoming banquet, and one of my <laughs> <laughs> One of the big memories from this is they start playing all this American music like Home on the Range. So you've got this Chinese orchestra playing Home on the Range. But it was a, it was a and, wonderful banquet. And, and, yeah, they're, they're, they're toasting. and they play God Bless America. Yeah. And here they're toasting with the most vile liquor you could ever have. Yeah. <clears throat> it's called Mao Tai, not Mai Tai, Mao. And it smelled like formaldehyde. And, it, and many of us became... Uh, recovering alcoholics by the second day. We can't drink that. I, I took a bottle of this stuff back to the, brought it back home, and uh, we would have people over for dinner or something, and I would pour a little bit into a plate, and it would burn for like an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Larry. Uh, this is the picture from the Great Wall, and remember, uh, the American public got to take this trip with us, and it was quite an interesting trip. You, 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 if you think about it, uh, this is one of the symbols of China. Old China and China today. And uh, to see an American president walking on that wall was really quite something. Also, probably for those of you who are really inside politicos, if you can barely see this guy back here, you know, this is the great conservative Pat Buchanan walking <laughs> on the wall and acting like a little kid. He was so excited to be there. Uh, you went so fast. I thought that was Deng Xiaoping next to him. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. 
Here's some picture of the president on the wall. And uh, uh, before that, you saw some of the houses we went by on the way out to the wall. Uh, a very, very special moment and a unique moment. And I think anybody who's ever had the privilege of going to China will be very impressed with, uh, with what's there. We uh, put this in here because this, this was the ever-present staged children. Wherever we went, there were these staged children dressed in colorful clothes doing all of these kinds of little games and so forth. Remember, everyone else was in a gray mouse suit. Yeah. And what makes this particularly <clears throat> significant is that uh, Ted Koppel on ABC, he was the ABC correspondent on the trip, did a piece uh, on the staging of these little kids at the Ming tombs, which Nixon left after he went to the Great Wall. And so that evening, uh, when the, or the next time that President Nixon met with Cho and Lai, Cho and Lai apologized to the president for the staging of the stuff. He was, they were horrified. So it, it, the other thing that it proves is they were really tracking what was going on with the U.S. media and how this was being covered because they knew immediately that this had happened. The, uh, the, next, the next thing here, I mean, despite the fact the trip had probably been declared a success, the real purpose of going was to normalize relations. That was going to be very difficult to do if we didn't have a communique that clearly expressed how the two countries' relationships would begin to take place on a going forward basis. So we finally got literally the last day, I, I, I would say a couple hours before we were leaving, everybody was still running around, the Shanghai communique. And the essence of the whole problem was what's going to happen with Taiwan versus mainland China. And, and in a short, shorthand, what we really agreed was agreed to disagree going forward, but we would continue to improve our relationship and make this really a, a lasting a lasting event, not just an event, as we moved ahead. And, and the, the Chinese were very straightforward in their negotiation, unlike most other countries that we had experienced. And Joe and Lai said, you list what you agree and disagree, and we'll list what we agree and disagree. That's, and we start from there and say, and we agree to disagree on the problem of Taiwan. And this is Shanghai. This is the departure from, from the PRC. And I'm in uniform, which is significant only because the last Americans to leave China in 1949 was the Marine delegation from Peking. As a matter of fact, I was asked to not come back in uniform. I suggested that I not wear a uniform, but Marines sometimes are defiant. We left, uh, <coughs> we left Shanghai, and then no ceremony here. The ceremony is when you leave the, <coughs> the capital city of a country. So you notice we came into Shanghai, the arrival ceremony is in Peking, vice versa. So we left with a, a, certainly a sense of accomplishment, very tired and knowing that we were a little part of history. And then uh, here we are coming back into the United States on, uh, on Air Force One. We landed at Andrews Air Force Base in prime time on television, because <laughs> thanks to these guys. And a great picture is, it was February in Washington and very cold, and all of the welcoming crowds were inside of this huge hangar. And we taxied Air Force One into the hangar. And a, one of the great pictures I've ever seen is a, a photographer took a picture over the pilot's shoulder through the cockpit onto the welcoming people there. So we were met by Vice President Agnew, which was a little bit, he was very much a pro-Taiwan, anti-trip guy, as we're, which is one of the major reasons this was kept so secret, not from Vice President Agnew, but for the conservatives in America who could lobby the Congress to squelch the whole thing. Uh, the Bill Buckley's, who was a conservative columnist and a leader of the conservatives, Agnew himself, who was denouncing the, so, it had to be secret or it would never have been pulled off. And Jack? This is uh, four years later. Uh, at this time, I was civilian chief of staff to uh, the former president. He, he had left office two years before this, but remained a huge friend of China until, until he died. And they, the Chinese approached me through Han Su, who was then in Washington, um, and said that President Nixon is welcome to return to China. And they proudly said that we will send a Boeing 707 for him <laughs> to pick you guys up. They had purchased, uh, started purchasing American products. They purchased Boeing 707s. So we went to uh, China. This was in, uh, <clears throat> almost four years to the day. And uh, I was privileged to uh, be included in the, this small group to meet Jim and Mao. And uh, Clay asked if I would give a little impression. As a matter of fact, as you can tell when I don't pronounce my R's, I am not from SC. <laughs> I, <laughs> my alma mater is a small college in Rhode Island called Providence College. And to Providence College, I gave all of the junk I collected around the world. And, and online, you can find, I did 
contemporaneous notes, especially on this trip. Any of you are interested, all that stuff's there you can find online. And in my contemporaneous notes of this, I uh, described from the time they met us, same thing, the foreign minister came to my room and said, Jim and Mao would like to meet with President Nixon. He wants you to come because you're loyal. Chinese are very into loyalty. You with President Nixon when he was president, and as were many, many other people now. It's just you on and on and on. So <clears throat> my impression of Chairman Mao, as I dictated him, uh, as I wrote in my notes, was, was I was shocked by the guttural groans that emanated from him, just like as if someone had a stroke. And I, I said in my notes, if, and of course I knew he had a different dialect, which he was from Hunan province, and, and so the interpreters just said, if this is the Hunan dialect, then cavemen were eloquent. Because <laughs> it was just, you know, grunting, and then, and then the, the cute little interpreter would say, Chairman Mao says it should go on and on and on. I said, yeah, sure. And anyway. <laughs> in order to underscore the significance of this trip, several years ago an opera was created on Nixon in China. Uh, this year, that opera is opening on February the 2nd at, in the New York Met. Uh, it's going to be quite a show. It's going, they're going to have something like 11 different productions of this. And on February 12th, it's going to be seen in 1,500 movie theaters in 46 countries. So the significance of that uh, is being underscored by, by, by this opera. So we, we believe that this was probably the most significant presidential journey in the history of American diplomacy. And we do believe that this trip changed the world, and your next panel will help help uh, confirm that. And that's the end of our presentation. We have a couple of minutes for questions if you would like to ask us any. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes for your questions, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and please make it a short question. Mr. Lester. Uh, my question is, what is the role of the Secretary of State Rogers in all of this? He clearly played a role in the execution of the trip, and the State Department was very much involved. I think, I think Kissinger and Nixon had a very close day-to-day -day working relationship and proximity. The fact that, the pres that uh, uh, Mr. Kissinger, who was assistant to the president, was in the White House made it conven very convenient for him uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to confer quite often. But he clearly was part of it, too. And there's a lot of discussion about he being the representative to go on the make the arrangements in the secret trip. And the conclusion was that he was way too visible. Had anyone seen him, bingo, immediately. And then Kissinger, when they finally picked Kissinger, they also thought about uh, Ellsworth Bunker. And for the same reason said, well, we should discount him. And when they said, Kissinger, you, he didn't particularly want to go. He loved being next to the president and seeing him every morning. There, there, and there was another major yeah. difference that I would point out, and that is that Kissinger was staff and would take orders and go do them. Bill Rogers didn't look at himself that way uh, properly, so he was the Secretary of State, and he had a whole different mentality of how he would have come at it. One more? Anybody? If not, I have a C story. <clears throat> yes. Oh, there's Professor, a question. Professor Holt. It seems uh, it's a very significant presidential journey. It's significant in what respect? Can you actually pin down what is the concrete outcome of the thing that you think of him? <laughs> sure, really. Um, well. A lot of that will come up let Larry hit. Well, I think it, I think basically it opened the world to China and opened China to the world. I think it changed the path of China. I think it started to open up China, uh, and I think you've seen China on a path for the last 40 years, really. It's very different than the path they had pursued 40 years before that. I think people in all countries and around the world react to China differently now than they did 40 years ago. So that was the fundamental change. I think there was another change, though, that a lot of people forget about. It really set into process, even though it took some time after that, the, the, the necessary elements to finally end the Vietnam War, to finally end the Vietnam War. And if you were living during that period of time and wrestling with that every day in the White House and in Washington as we were, that probably was at least equally as significant and equally as important. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you.